a bit what we saw last time, or some of the main ideas we saw last time. So first we saw that if we have a two-point function, we can always map points x1, x2 to 0, 1 by a conformal transformation. And therefore, the two-point function should be totally fixed. Because we can write a two-point function at two locations as some trivial factors times two-point function at 0, 1. And so if you know it at 0, 1, which is just a number, you know it at any location. So indeed, the two-point function was totally fixed. Then we saw that by a conformal transformation, I can also map x1, x2, x3, three points, to a, some fixed locations, whatever I want. For example, 0, 1, half, 1. Or it could be 0, 1, infinity, whatever. Some fixed location. And therefore, if I call this a number, but now it's a new number, because if I fix this number to be 1 up here, this one now is not up to me. Now this is a new number. It, this is what the number we call here was the structure constant, C, 1, 2, 3. If this guy we normalize to 1, then this is now physical. Right? So we normalize the two-point function. Now the three-point function is physical. And, uh, and what was the result? If I fix this C1, 2, 3, the three-point function was that C1, 2, 3, that number, divided by some very explicit space-time dependence. How could we find it? By just working out the omegas, the local dilatations, that you generate by doing the map from these points to those points. Okay, and I just wrote here more or less the kind of ideas you need to do it. So let me just go through this. As I said, I promised I would put it here in the blackboard. I have three points. How do we map these three points to 0, 1, half, 1? I remind you, one idea is first, you put O2 at the origin, O3 somewhere in the unit disk, and O1 at infinity. Okay, so that one is very easy. It's done here. So let's see that it works. So what did I do here? So here at the first step, we do a translation so that x1 is at the origin. Then we do an inversion. Now x1 is at infinity. Right? So this stuff is sending x1 to infinity. Move it to the origin and do an inversion. So now x1 is at infinity. Then you take whatever you get and you subtract a number, which is the same thing, a constant vector, where x mu is x2. So now x2 is at the origin, indeed. So x1 is at infinity, x2 is at the origin. But where is x3? x3 is somewhere. So you, now you divide by a number, which is just the, whatever this vector is, at x equal to x3. So now x3 is at the unit disk. Right? By definition, when I compute, when I plug here x3, I get the vector, and I divide by the norm of the vector, so this thing is in the unit disk. So this transformation here, that I wrote here, does this job of going this way. Now, it's not the end of the story. Then I have to do a rotation to put O3 aligned. But the rotation doesn't pick any factors. After rotations, we shift. After shifting, we invert. And now we are in this. So this is half. And there is the second half. The second half is almost trivial. There is one last inversion at the end. OK. Now, let's work out, for example, what would be the dilatation factors. The dilatation factor, I want to compute it for the point x3. What is it? Well, because I do this inversion, this is just a shift, doesn't matter. But this inversion, I pick this factor 1 over x squared. Here, 1 over x3 minus x1 squared. So this is from the dilatation. All right? But I also make a, dil a dilatation by this factor. So I have to divide by the square root of v squared. And v squared, if you compute what it is, it's given by this. A simple computation to compute the norm of this vector, it's this, at x equal to x3. And therefore, when I multiply this, it will flip some uh, x13, and the total result is this. OK, but this is only half. What's the other half? Well, the other half, I need omega for the second half, evaluated at the starting point, which is evaluated at x tilde half of x3. You agree? Now, x tilde half is this point. I go from this point, which is finite. And what do we do? Rotation, translations, and inversions, but always a finite points, right? It's on the unit disk, then it's at 1, then it's at 2, then you invert, it goes to 1 half, right? It's always finite points, right? So we are dealing with numbers at this point. So this is just a number. There's no dependence on positions. And so the product of this times the number is just this. I don't care about the numbers. And so this tells me that the three-point function will have this factor, 
to the power minus delta 3. And indeed, if you go to all the factors, if you, if you care for who is raised to the power delta 3, you would recognize precisely this exponent. And then by symmetry, you have a similar factor for x2 and x1, and, uh, and that gives you the full three-point function. Okay, so the, I, as promised, so here is it done in detail. Now, what about four-point function? So for four points, here is something I did not tell you last time, let me tell you now. You cannot put the points at 0, 1, infinity, but you can almost do it. So let's think how. So you have four points. So first thing, as usual, so we shift one point to the origin. Now this one is at the origin. Now we send, we invert. Now that point is at infinity. So now we have three finite points and one is at infinity. The one at infinity will stay at infinity. Now we make a shift such that one of them is at the origin. Now we make a rotation such that one of, one of them is in the x-axis. Now we make a dilatation such that that one is at 1. So now we have a point at 0, a point at 1, a point at infinity, and we have x3 somewhere. Or x4, whatever. One of the points is somewhere. Now that point that is somewhere, we can first rotate it to put it in our favorite plane. Right? Because there is this axis, 0, 1, infinity. It's a line, and I can rotate under that line to put it in my favorite plane. And I'm done. Now I cannot do anything else. So what, what, I've, what I end up with is I am in the plane, and I have 0, 1, infinity, and the point parameterized by the coordinates on the plane, x and y. Now I can't do anything more. If I try to rotate, I take this point out of 1. If I try to make a dilatation, I also take it out of 1. I cannot do anything more. Now it's, it's done. So a four-point function is parameterized by two degrees of freedom, the location on the plane. And indeed, that's what we saw. We saw that there was some trivial space dependence times a function of two cross ratios. So these two cross ratios, you can think of them as being x and y. In other words, if you plug these four positions in the cross ratios, you will literally relate the cross ratios to x and y. OK? So these two cross ratios, these two, is of course these two. The last thing we saw was that if you think that you can do this path integral radially, you start with two points, right? And after these two points, when you do the path integral, you have some state. And you can evolve it to some, some sphere that you want. Then you get some state on some sphere, right? But now you can take that and evolve backwards. <laughs> and you can go all the way to a very small circle around the origin. Right? That will define again some state, but some around some very tiny circle, really close to the origin. So that there's almost no more evolution to do. I'm already at the origin. And then at, at that, that state will be a li I can write as a linear combination of all possible states, each state being what is generated by the operator OI. And so two operators have the same effect. I can just replace them by an infinite sum. OK? So this is it. This is the argument. In the one in the lecture, I often drew cylinders because I like cylinders and because for me it helps me think. But as someone came to ask me, could we do it without cylinders? We can. So this would be the argument just arguing with radial, going back and forth. It is just that cylinders for me are nicer because I'm used to evolving things in time. So time, I know how quantum mechanics works. and it's, But it's the same thing, right? Time is dilatation. Because in a CFT, doing this radial evolution is doing time evolution in the cylinder. So fine. Now, um, then uh, we know that two operators we can write as a sum of all possible operators of the theory put at the origin. But the operators can either be derivatives of someone else or not. That means they can be primaries or can be descendants. Primaries are the ones that are not derivatives of something else. And so I can sum only over the primaries and then put the derivatives explicitly there, right? And so this is the primary, and all these guys are the descendants, right? And this one here is the primary. OK. Let me make uh, just one more comment. This is an expansion, right? So we have an, uh, we replace an operator for any x 
I did this expansion, replace it by an operator, and someone asked me, what's the radius of convergence of this expansion? When do we know that this is okay to do? All right? Now, if I'm here, what happened? What can I do? This x, I can, I can evolve this to any place I want, right? But I can do it provided there is no obstacle to grow. So suppose there was an operator here, O, 3, at Y. Now I can evolve, but only up to O3. Right? I cannot pass by O3, right? Remember, in, again, I'll go back to the cylinder. In the cylinder, this will act with an operator at O1, then at a later time act with an operator, and then at O3 act with an operator. So you only know the state up to the operator. After the operator, you don't know the state anymore, because you need to act with O3 to know the state after that time. And so the radius of convergence is until the next operator, until you find the next operator. So you can plug this relation inside a correlation function. So if you have correlation function, bracket, O1, O2, dot, dot, dot. Now you can use this relation until you reach the first operator in the dot, dot, dot. Right? So if you have a point Y here, and if you have a point Z here, Z is further away, the radius of convergence is when X is smaller than Y. Right? So it's the, up to this circle you can go, but you cannot go beyond. In other words, you can put this X, you can take this X and make it approach Y and it's still okay, but it cannot pass by Y. Right? X cannot go further than Y, otherwise I'm violating this stuff. And so this will have a radius of convergence, which is equal to the location of the closest operator. I had a question. Is these things, where if there is a, a correlation function, then we know how many operators we have. But like in a theory, to the next operator, every operator can be defined at every point, right? So how, how do we say this statement has a radius of convergence? If there was a correlation function, then we know that there are operators only at fixed x1, x2, x3, and things like that. Right, right. So radius of convergence inside a correlation function is equal to this. Otherwise, it's a, if I don't have other operators, it's infinity, the radius of convergence. So I'm saying that this relation, you could think it's infinity, the radius of convergence, that it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that be careful. If there are other operators outside, you must do it until you reach other operators. Yes, so means when we say that there are, there are operators outside, it means we are talking about the correlation function. It means yeah. in, in the theory, any operator can be defined in at any place, right? There's no, means like, oh, X can be O of X1, O of X2. In principle, that object is defined. The operator itself. Yeah. I'm just telling you that if you, if you see a correlation function, you could think, when I see an O1 and an O2, I will replace them by this sum. Yeah. And I'm saying, be careful. You can do it if they are the closest operators. If there is an O3 in the middle between the two, you cannot do it. You should do, then you should do the OPE between 0 and, and uh, Y, not 0 and X. Yeah. So you cannot fuse operators if they are not the closest operators. Okay, so, so now the basic question is, of course, this would be powerful and this will be powerful if we can, if we can have some control over all these uh, constants that we decompose our state. And that's what we want to discuss next. So, so the... What we will be using is these two main equations here, the one we ended our lecture with, and this form of the three-point function. The three-point function, if I put operator, I put one of them at zero, one at x, one at y, I get this formula here. Right? And now the idea is very simple. We just want to take this equation, and we want to sandwich this equation, and take this equation, and we'll sandwich this, we'll put this inside the correlation function, where I'll close the parentheses here, and I'll put some operator O3 of Y here, and then I'll close this. So I'll do precisely what I say here, I have, two I have a point here at zero, a point here at X, there is a point further away here at Y, and I'm computing the correlation function 
of this, where I'm doing the OPE between point zero and X. Okay, so let's do it. And now let's see, so what is this guy here? So this is a primary with some dimension delta three. And so the first thing we see is that when I put this correlation function, the sum over k becomes just, or the sum, let me not write k, let me write ok. The sum over ok, the sum over the primary operators ok, each element will give me 0 unless ok is O3. Because we saw the two-point function is orthogonal, right? Two-point function between two different operators is zero. Only when it's the same operator. And so this three-point function becomes just this, this sum with some fk becomes just f for operator O3. Right? When I plug this into the sum, only k equal O3 contributes. Okay, so that's a big simplification. And so what do we get? We get that the three-point function, O1 at 0, O2 of x, O3 of y, is equal to C. I don't want to put C3. Let me do the following. Let me put, instead of 3, let me put K. Let me call K here. Then I get C, K. I'm just extracting the element K, just so that I'll 3. I'll, I'll forget. C, K of X, correlation function of OK at 0, OK at y. That's the first term. Plus c mu k of x, derivative with respect to mu of the correlation function ok of 0, ok of y. Plus c mu 1 mu 2 k of x d mu 1 d mu 2 acting on the correlation function ok of 0 ok of 1. So that, that just, let me just precise that when I mean derivative, I mean here it was x, I take derivative and then I plug x equal to 0. Right? Because that's what that means, right? It's derivative of the operator and then evaluate that x equal to 0. But it doesn't matter much because this is this is only a function of the of the different square, so I can also take derivative with respect to y. So uh, so it's fine. We can just put derivative and we take derivative to this with respect to whatever we see. Right? Taking derivative with respect to x or y is the same because it's a function of x minus y squared. But the, the way it started the derivation, I should think this is I should really put here x, and then say after taking derivative I set x. But again, that's the same as taking derivative respect to y. Yes? What's the argument for the other correlation functions to not matter? Like the OK for K? Like the OK, okay with OK prime is zero because the two-point function of OK, OK prime is zero. Right? When I plug that and I sandwich, I get a sum of two-point functions, right? But the two-point function was zero unless the operators were the same. That was one of the things we proved last time. Sorry? Like only the scaling dimension that matters at the end? Shouldn't you be summing over all OK at okay. the same scaling dimension as the, the O3? OK, well, so let me open a parenthesis. Um, um, so strictly speaking, what we got is that the oper if I have two operators, OK and OK prime, indeed, what we show is that this is 0 unless delta K equal to delta K prime. 
that implies that OK, OK prime is equal to some matrix D K K prime over X to the power two delta for equal dimensions. But this is a symmetric matrix, so I can always diagonalize and write it as delta of kk prime, choose the basis of operators where this is the case. And so this, I would call this a good basis. So if there is degeneracy, use this. Right? So if they have many primaries that have the same dimension, use the two-point function, diagonalize the two-point function such that then they are orthonormal, and then use that basis as what we call OK. Right. So this is just a change of basis, right? Is this symmetric by definition? So you can always diagonalize it. So that's what we mean by this. Then, uh, good. So we get this. We get uh, this expression uh, over here. Now, this is what we are getting for the three-point function. On the other hand, this is the three-point function. We know we fix it by conformal symmetry. Right? And uh, let me write this distance here uh, as for, let me write, let me do the following manipulation. <clears throat> let me take x, absolute value of x out of this equation. Then, let me see, delta 1 cancels, delta 3 cancels, and delta 2 survives. So I get C123, absolute value of x to the power delta 2, maybe 2 delta 2, right? I take absolute value of x from the last equation. Absolute value of y to the power delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. And then... We have the following, let me write, and then uh, we can see together that we agree. Uh, oops. No, I, I took out a power of delta y. Same. That's right. Sorry. I did something else. Sorry about that. So I took out some power of delta y. So I wrote this as x I did not touch. So x to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. By the way, sorry. Let's change 3 to k so that we can compare the two blackboards. So where we see 3, we put k. y to the 2 delta k. And then uh, we have here 1 minus 2x dot y over y square plus x square over y square to the power delta 2 plus delta k minus delta 1 over 2. No, it's probably some signs are wrong. Probably all signs are wrong. Minus, minus one. Can you draw your three-point correlation function? The power for y is probably not right. So but the x and y have the same power. Delta one plus uh, three three minus delta. Delta y should be power delta one plus plus delta k. Good. Minus delta two. Thank you. And what about here? X minus Y to the power delta 2 plus delta K minus delta 1. Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's right. And now, so now, so you agree what I did here. So what I did here, X minus Y, right? Absolute value of X minus Y to some power A is just X minus Y square to the power A over 2. And then x minus y square is just x square minus 2x dot y plus y square. Right? And you divide it by y square and you got this and this. Right? So it's some trivial manipulation. But now we can take this expression and expand it at small x. 
And if we expand it at small x, let's write what this is. This is equal to c1 to k divided by x to some power, delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta k, absolute value of y to the power 2 delta k. And then if we expand that small x, the first term is 1, when I set x to 0. The second term is minus delta 2 minus delta 1 plus delta k, that exponent. The 2 cancels these two, so divided by, not divided by nothing, just this. Um, times x dot y divided by also x squared plus dot dot dot. But now, you see what's happening, that uh, this should be compared to these expressions here, right? Where all these propagators, this is just 1 over uh, y to the power 2 delta k, right? This one is 1 over y to the power 2 delta k, and therefore when I take the derivative, this derivative is just y mu divided by uh, y squared times 1 over y to the 2 delta k. And this guy, etc. You can just take more derivatives. And now, you see that you can just look at this expression and look at that expression and compare and read off what these c's that we did not know there are. So now, at this point, we just compare. And when we compare, what do we learn? Let's write here, what's the conclusion? That should be a plus sign or something, right? Both the signs in the here? Because you're pulling out a minus from there. Minus and minus. It's like if you see the sign of delta 2, overall sign of delta 2 should be positive, right? Because there is a minus in front of 2xy and the exponent is also minus. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, here I you should have... Uh, this is wrong. The, that sign it might be... Yeah, but what about this? Is this correct? Did I take the derivative correctly? Just derivative of 1 over i over y to the two delta k. Was this correct? There are at least, there are two mistakes. There is a three factor missing and the... Uh, so what factor is missing? Uh, Derivative of this expression. Minus two delta k is missing. Yeah. All right. Minus two delta k, right? And then there is... Ah, that's it. That's the, that's the two mistakes. One is delta k, one is the... That's right. And there, uh, the sign was wrong. OK. So now, we just equate, uh, uh, we just equate both equations. And then we see, let's compare, and you tell me if you agree, that ck of x is equal to c 
1, 2, k divided by absolute value of x to the power delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta k. The first term is matched with the first term there. C k mu of x is equal to, let me put here 1, and let me write times c1, 2k. The second one is delta 1 minus delta 2 minus delta k divided by 2 delta k x mu 1 over absolute value of x to the power delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta k times c 1 2 k and so on I'm not going to write the detail but I'm just going to write that c mu 1 mu 2 k of x is going to be some tensor b mu nu of x times C1, 2, K. Or maybe more generally, even mu1 dot 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 is going to be some tensor B1 dot dot dot. But similarly, in the same way that we could fix these structures here, the point is that all these tensors are fixed. It might be a bit boring to expand many, many terms, but we know them now. And the key thing is that all these guys are fixed in terms of this number C1 to K. So there is C1 to K. This is dynamics. Multiplied by a bunch of factors. Right? Multiplied by a bunch of factors like this. And this, right? and these factors instead are kinematics. Right? So these factors are just conformal symmetry, just group theory, if you want, that fixes all these factors. And the dynamics, really the strength of the interaction, is in this constant C1 to K, that it's just a number that depends, changes from theory to theory. Right? Do you agree? The, the, so first of all, the algebra works out now, right? I feel there's no mistakes, right? So here I, I put no minus, but I flip the signs. I hope you follow that, that and you agree with me that everything's okay. And uh, this x mu appears because I need an x dot y there, and there I have a y mu, right? So that c mu must be proportional to x mu. And more generally, uh, all these c's, they will be proportional to just powers of x, mu 1, x mu n. And then the precise constant will be uh, fixed uh, by uh, just equating both sides. And so what we see is that these terms, are totally fixed, and we see that as we go down, they are uh, more subleading as x goes to zero. They have extra more and more powers of x, right? Here it's one power of x, here it will be n powers of x, which is the usual intuition that when I replace two operators by one operator, it's like you have monopole plus dipole plus quadrupole. They become more or less and less important. So it is the primary operator gives the main contribution, and the descendants are corrections to it that fix and that tell you it's not just one operator, but it's one operator and it's derivatives and tell you exactly how you should combine the derivatives. But should, will it also not depend on the deltas? Because you have more de power deltas in the expression. So for x going to 0, we look here even in the second expression and we see mu k. So the second term, the x squared term, will come both from the second term in the parentheses and from the square of the middle term in the parentheses. And you will have to... Uh, 
And uh, that one, you will uh, then uh, keep expanding in X. And when you equate to that, you will see what uh, this X is. What I'm saying is this, uh, instead of the comment you made about X going to zero, there is also a mod X power delta, right? This mod X is overall. This factor is common to everyone. So then uh, it's about these extra powers of x. This power of x appears to everyone, and it's just dimensional analysis. OK, so, so again, the key punchline is that the c's are all fixed, and they are kinematics, up to a single. a single number, which is dynamics. Now, in practice, can we find them all? Or they are fixed in principle? You no, know, yes, you can find them all in practice. It would be a pain to find it this way. There are clev more clever ways of finding the cis, but you could. And uh, I'm going to tell you what the resummation of all these cis is in a bit. Why can't we take x go to zero? Is it that this three point function only valid when we have x near zero? Or it is valid everything? So the three point function divided by this trivial factor, right? Then we can take to, to zero. Right? So I mean, in the right board, we need yeah. to need to take x to near zero, right? This three point function. This is general. That's general, yeah. But I mean, I derive we take x equals 0. So we expand around x equals 0, yeah. Because then we can uh, recognize that the expansion around 0 is the expansion that we have there. And therefore, we can compare term by term and just uh, read off the coefficient. The fact that this is true, it has to be the case just by dimensional analysis. Because this term compared to the first term, it has two more derivatives. And so by dimensional analysis, it vanishes two times faster compared to the first one. And so it's, it's not like a miracle. It is just dimensional analysis that because you have more and more derivatives, you'll be more and more suppressed at low energy, at short distance. OK. So now, the, the punchline then is then we know this piece. So the, the, the key thing, as I said, is that these are known. The bees we know. And now we can move to the, to the main claim of today, which is that if we know the CFT data, namely the deltas and the Cs, we know all correlation functions. The idea, as I said, is that the, the strategy is if you have a correlation function, take two points and fuse. Then take the third one and fuse with that one. Then take whatever, and you do it fusing very many times. And each time you fuse, everything is known or up to some Cs. And so you should know all the correlation functions. So that's the basic argument. But let's see it in detail. Okay. So now what we want to see, our goal next is to see that if I know the set of all C, I, J, K, and the set of all that K, this is gives as all correlation functions. Right? So to see it, let's do it on the four point function. So let's, as an example, consider the four point function O1, O2, O3, O4. And let me write uh, the following. Let me say that this, if I apply the OPE, let's say for the points three and four, will be a sum over K, or over the primaries OK. Then uh, there will be the following. Let's write here. There would be. O1 at x1, 
O2 at X2 and OK at X3. Right, X3 now is the new origin. But now, what is it? What do we get here? We don't get this correlation function, right? We get these OKs, but there are all these descendants there. If I use that equation, but that equation I can write like this. So let me write it. I can say that these are just this. I take derivatives d mu one up to mu n of this equation, where these derivatives are with respect to x three, the third point. Then uh, I multiply this by b mu one up to mu n. Again, I emphasize this will be a function of x4 minus x3. And these guys are fixed. They are known. Right? Now, this three-point function is proportional to c1 to k. So let me put here. I need some space. Erase. Sum over OK. Now let me put here, first this B is multiplied by some C, 3, 4, K. Then this product is what gives the Cs. And this three-point function is proportional to C, 1, 2, K. So let me multiply and divide by C, 1, 2, K here. And here we have a sum over n from 0 to infinity. And then I put a parenthesis. Because I won't. OK? Now, notice that these parentheses here is just Kinematics, right? Everything here is fixed. The b's we just fixed. The three-point function divided by the structure cost is just one divided by x by a bunch of powers, so it's fixed. And so we took out the three-point functions completely from this picture. They are here. Right? And so we really separated kinematics from the dynamics here. And so this function is a function that now we could compute. I just need to make a table of these b's. I need to do this sum. And this is a function that you compute once, and that's it. You store it, and you know it. So this function here is what is called a function f that depends on x1 up to x4. It depends on the operator OK that you are exchanging. And this function is fixed, and it's called a conformal block. Now, the precise form of this block requires knowing all these b's, doing the sum, and so on. But it's something that, if you are powerful enough, you just do it. right? But you need to, to work a little bit hard. But you have everything here in the blackboards to do it. So now I'm going to tell you what this block, what the solution is in a second. But first, let me just write this in a famous picture. So the famous picture is that what we are doing here is saying that, in practice, we are saying that I have operator 1 and operator 2. And I fuse them, and I got operator k. And I have operator 3 and operator 4 that I fuse. And then I get operator k again, because they are orthogonal. And what this picture means is that there is a structure constant here. There is a structure constant here. And there is a block here. Block is fixed, it's kinematics, and C and C is what we need.
So it's very it's nice to look at what the, how this block looks like. So let's write it down. So this block that depends on OK. So first of all, it's a function of all these points, x1 up to x4. And let me write what it is. So the first thing you can do is take out some space-time dependence that you know the four-point function has, which could be... Uh, so here, now, I'm writing the result for all identical operators. Delta 1 equal delta 2 equal delta 3 equal delta 4 equal to delta. Of course, you don't need to do it, but uh, in most cases, we consider four identical operators, and uh, it's already very complicated. If you want, you can put different deltas, but this is simple, interesting enough. Then, as we saw the four-point function, we could write it as x1 minus x2 to the power 2 delta, x3 minus x4 to the power 2 delta, and then a function of cross ratio. And so now we will have a block here, a function here, that is a function of cross ratio. So times a function of these cross ratios, let me call them u and v, where u is equal to x12 square, x34 square. These are these differences of x, of course, x13 square and x24 square. This is what I wrote last time that someone corrected me that I had a 3 repeated twice downstairs. And v is the same thing downstairs, x13 square, x24 square, but upstairs it's a bit different. It's x. 1, 4 square, x, 2, 3 square. Now, if you write these cross ratios and you parameterize them using this x and y that I told you here, you can ask, what are these two cross ratios if I put the points like this? Because I can. And you ask, how do they look like in terms of this x and y? So then what you get, a nice parameterization is that they become equal. This guy becomes equal to z times z bar. And this becomes equal to 1 minus z times 1 minus z bar, where z is just x plus i y and z bar is the complex conjugate. In other words, z times z bar is the square of the distance to the origin. 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar is the square of the distance to the point 1. Now, why am I writing this? Because u and v, I, parameterizing things with u and v is equivalent to z and z bar, and it turns out that this function f looks nicer in terms of z and z bar than it does in terms of u and v. So finally, what is then this function f? This function f, now we have to write what it is. It's equal. Now you see that here, when we start expanding and taking derivatives, right, and when we compare both sides, you see that these constants depend on deltas, the dimensions of the operators, right? You easily start seeing that it also actually depends on the dimension of space-time. It doesn't appear here because we are not taking enough derivatives. But when you start taking uh, many derivatives, like derivatives, two derivatives of x squared, you get x mu the first time, the second time you get delta mu nu, and you start taking traces and you start getting dependence on the dimension. So this function f depends on the dimension. So let me write it for you for d equals either 2 or 4. Which one do you prefer? Dimension, two dimensions or four dimensions? Four dimensions. So let's write what the result is for d equal to 4. For d equal to 4, the result is the following. is 1 over z minus z bar times a function f okay it's not exactly it's z times z bar over z minus z bar a function h 
that depends on the dimension of the exchange operator delta uh, k uh, plus okay let me put plus zero and then I'll fix the zero over two this function of z h of delta k minus 0 minus 2 divided by 2 of z bar. So you see why it's important to write z and z bar because the, the function wants to be a function of z and z bar. Of course, you can write z and z bar as function of u and v, but it becomes very, very messy. Minus the same thing where you swap z and z bar. Okay, almost done. Now we just need to tell you what h is, right? So we're almost done. And now finally, where h lambda of x is an hypergeometric function, f to 1, with argument lambda, lambda, 2 lambda, and then x. Okay, so that is the result in uh, four dimensions. Zeros are... Good. Now, why did I put some zeros there? Because uh, delta plus zero is zero. So let me now conclude this in these remaining five minutes by um, uh, making everything a little bit more precise and fixing those zeros. But uh, for now, is there any question here? So this looks... Like a miracle, how could we do this resummation of all these constants and then get something as simple or complicated, it depends on the taste, as this, but at least as rich as this. It's very rich, right? So it's indeed tough to do it. It, it was like this that it was done the first time by Dolan and Osborne. So this, all these results, they were found, the people that found them first were Dolan and Osborne. I forgot if it was in 94 or 2004, I forgot. Oh, it was relatively recently, but... Uh, and it was like this that it was found the first time, just computing many, many terms and recognizing that it's the Taylor expansion of some hypergeometric and so on. But it's not the modern way of deriving these conformal blocks. There are now more clever ways that we know. Now that we know it's some function of u and v, there are clever ways of finding some differential equation that this function should satisfy, and that would be the proper way of doing it. If you want, I can tell you a little bit more about it. But conceptually, you agree that that board fixes the function, right? So we know the function. It's just a question of working it out. Someone did, this is it. You could now expand and check many terms of the expansion that it works, and you would be convinced that it's right. You'd say, wow, I don't know how you guessed it, but it's clearly correct, right? But uh, the function is totally fixed. Now, here, I oversimplified, and uh, throughout these lectures, up to now, I oversimplified, which is, we always thought of operators as scalars. But the world is not made of scalars only. The world has scalar operators, but it has operators with spin. Right? You can have operators that have spin. And so, strictly speaking, what you should do, you should also imagine that in the sum of primary operators, that was just for the scalars, there is also operators with spin that you need to sum. And so when you make the OPE, you need to analyze, you need to sum over operators with spin. So in this picture, flowing here, you have operators that have dimension delta and spin S. And S is the spin. And then uh, you will have some blocks fk, f, that depend on delta and spin as well. It's not just, and what, what I wrote there was spin equal to zero. Because we just computed for the scalar. How would you compute it if you wanted to do it for different spin? Well, you would just repeat that derivation, but doing O1, O2, and OK would, would be OK with spin. Then you need to ask, can I fix by symmetry O1, O2, and OK with spin? Yes. You need to work a bit harder. You need to know how operators transform when you have spin, etc. You can do it. Okay. If this was a CFT course, I would tell you how to do it. 
the ones that were in the CFT course probably you saw what it is, but uh, it's just possible to do. You do it, you find the block also with spin, and now this FOK is parameterized not just by the delta of the exchange operator, but by spin, and then this zero here is what you where you should put the spin. If you ask spin, replace this, put, put the spin there. And then this gives you the result for any block. Okay, so this was what it is. Uh, Even when we have spin, the equation that we use to define CFT, where we have operators, correlators equal to omega power some things into the correlator, that does not change? Or there should that equation changes a little bit. Uh, it, you have some Jacobian factors of spin, right? Because operators, when you make a rotation, for example, now the operator also changes if you have open ends. So, on the left and right hand side, you have not only those factors, but some rotation, some, some more factors because the operators have spin. So when you make a, a transformation, you have to see how the vector ends up pointing after and before the transformation. So it, things are a little bit more complicated. But, uh, but this is it. And so we have this powerful equation. So I need to take uh, five more minutes uh, today to tell you what could we do with this equation. And what could we do? So first of all, uh, let's stress that we achieved what we wanted to do. We proved that uh, if I know the three-point functions, I know everything, right? Because here is three-point function, three-point function, times this function, this function is known now. So if you give me the deltas and the c's, I just construct a four-point function, right? And if you wanted to do it for higher points, you could just keep going and doing this logic like this. And so indeed, this is established. This is just a true statement. At um, what we wrote here, and so any correlation function, uh, any correlation function, we can write. Let me write here so that we don't have to erase. Any four-point function up to O four, I can write in this way as I sum over operators one, two and three and four. And this sum is over all dimensions and spins that I could have. If the operators are identical for OI being identical scalar operators, S is even. Because you have some parity symmetry that you can swap operator one and two, and you must only sum over even spin. And so you have this expression where here I have some f. And this will be a function of uh, the delta and s that I sum. Now, you see that you could have written this equation, and this is a powerful equation. Not, no, it's not yet an equation. This is just the four point function. And here there is c. 1, 2, and here C, 3, 4. Let me write C, 1, 2 going into delta and S, and here 3, 4 going into delta and S. The S even is for what? Means that's all that we have to sum over, right? Yeah, we only sum over S even. Yeah. The operators that are flowing must have even spin, because the state that we have is a parity symmetric. Now, on the one hand, we write this equation, but we could have decided to fuse operators one and three instead of one and two. Right? If I have four points like this, I can fuse these two, or I can fuse the ones in the top. And so this correlation function is also equal to this picture where I fuse like this. One, three, and two, four. Right? Now, one, two, and three, four. It's just some relabeling of these points, so it transfer, it makes, it reshuffles the cross ratios when I swap the points one and two. And so in practice, this implies an equation of the form that you sum over all these structure constants. See, this, let's suppose all operators are identical operators, identical scalars. Then this index 1, 2, or 3, 4 is the same. So I sum over the structure constant that only depend on delta and s. I can omit the index 1, 2 because all the operators are identical. 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 1, 3, it doesn't matter. 
I have the square of them because they're all identical. So now instead of C times C, I have C square. Times the conformal block with some argument Z and Z bar is equal to the same sum of C square, delta and S with some conformal block with some different argument that could be something 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. I'm being a bit schematic, not complete. And this change, this is what you get if you just swap the points. You just swap the points one with point 2 with point 3, that's equivalent to swapping z to 1 minus z. Because remember this z, there is this, right? If you swap 1 minus z with z, you are swapping u and v. And u and v swapping is what you get if you swap operator 2 and 3, hopefully. If you swap 1 and 3, if you swap 1 and 3, yes. If you swap 1 and 3, u and v get swapped. And so uh, if you swap 1 and 3, you go to this equation. And now this is a very powerful equation. It's an equation that is called the bootstrap equation. So this is called the bootstrap equation. And you see that these equations you can think as an infinite set of equations for an infinite set of variables. This equation must be true for any z and z bar. So it's an infinite set, right? It's a functional equation. It, it must be true. For any z and z bar, if you impose it for z equals z bar equal one half, it must be true. So it's an infinite set of equations. And it has an infinite set of variables that are the in, all the structure constants and all the dimensions that appear in, 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 in these equations, right? Because there is a c square, and this guy I sum, and it depends on delta and s. Which deltas and s I sum show up here. So these equations are an infinite set of equations for an infinite set of variables. And it's this equation that you are going to play in today's tutorial. So how could you get anything useful out of this equation? It looks too hard, right? <laughs> you are summing these functions f that are some complicated functions and uh, you don't know what deltas you have. You don't know what structure constants you have. And how do you even start? And you have an infinite sum, uh, infinite things that you don't know, with some f's that are some monsters. And how could you ever succeed in doing anything useful out of it? And the basic idea is to notice that this c is squared, so it's positive. So suppose we write this equation in the form of something like sum of c square times this difference f minus f. You, you just subtract the equations and you write like this, where this, you call this some function h. Now these equations are still very hard. I just <laughs> put everything on the left hand side. It's not like I did some miracle. Right? This function h, this depends on delta and s, this depends on delta and s. Now what we could do is apply linear functionals to this equation. If this equation is true, I apply some linear functional to it, and 0, I apply some linear functional to 0, it's equal to 0. And so I have the same equation if I apply some linear functional to this h. All right? Any linear functional. Now, suppose you find a linear functional that acts on h and gives a positive number then it's impossible. This equation is impossible to satisfy. Because you cannot add up positive things times this and get zero. Right? So now we, we started with some equations that was totally hopeless. And now we are translating things into, can we find functionals that are positive? So if there exists a functional such that L acting on H is positive, then this equation has no solutions because c squared is positive. So the idea is you start with say, say, let's suppose I have some CFT with some deltas and with some deltas. If for that CFT this is true, then this would be impossible to solve. In other words, that CFT cannot exist. So in this way, you can start ruling out CFTs. 
you can start asking, could I have a CFT with this spectrum? And the answer is, if you can find this, no. Right? And so you can start excluding spaces of conformal field theories and narrowing down where could CFTs be? And playing with these functionals and exploring the consequences of this is the subject of today's tutorial. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sorry for going over time. Sorry, Davide. <laughs>